Hello all, namaste. Welcome to the second lecture of Inorganic Chemistry Group D, Analytical and Instrumental. This is Damodar Koyala. So in our first uh, lecture, we discussed about uh, the introduction and some terminologies related to titration. In today, in second lecture, we'll be discussing about the redox titration. According to the syllabus for redox titration, we are supposed to study the uses of potassium bromate, the uses of ceric salt, and about redox indicators. Now, before getting into the topic, let's revise this slide one more time. So there are different types of reaction and then based on those reactions, you have different types of titration. Uh, you are all familiar with acid-based titration and if you are no, like if you are good at acid-based titration, then all other titration, it will be easier to understand, okay? About redox titration, uh, it has a titrant as a oxidizing or reducing agent. That means in titration, you have conical flask and burette. Both of them contain reagent. One of them reagent is oxidizing agent and the other reagent is reducing agent. And you have some sorts of indicator in that titration, okay? Uh, remember you have two reagents here. In this example, there is iron and ceric cerium ions we'll be discussing the redox titration in detail uh, before i go into the topic i just want to uh, revise on the acid based titration so we are all on the same page uh, just look into this picture so this is acid based uh, titration I'm sure you all are familiar with these types of figures. So the first one is strong base weak acid uh, titration, you know, which is where the where the end point or the equivalent point is more than seven. Why it is more than seven? Because you are using strong base, and the base has pH higher than seven. So the end point also comes in higher pH. If you use a strong base, it, strong, uh, a strong base, a strong acid, then they neutralize, completely neutralize each other, and you form that the neutral point or the, uh, the equivalent point is at pH 7, okay? Because both of them are strong. And if you work with the strong acid and weak base, the equivalent point is below 7, because you are using strong acid and weak base. So strong acid predominates the equivalent point, okay? And the other one is weak base, weak acid, which we usually don't perform titration with because it is relatively difficult to determine the equivalent point. Now, if you look into these three uh, figures, uh, they have equivalent point at different pH. Okay, this is acid-base titration. Now also look into this figure, depending upon where the pH is, uh, you can only use certain types of indicator to determine the equivalent point. So here, you can use, there are three indicators listed in this uh, diagram for acid-base titration. One of them is phenolphthalein, the other one is litmus, and the other one is methyl orange. So phenolphthalein as an indicator, you can use it if the pH is in higher range. So that means if you are using a weak acid, strong base titration, then you can use phenolphthalein as an indicator because the equivalent point occurs in higher pH. The litmus, you can use it for several purposes. See, the range is six to more than eight in this figure. 
So you can use it for strong acid, strong base or other also, okay? Methyl orange, however, you can use it only when the equivalent point appears in lower pH. So if you're working with strong acid and the other uh, strong acid and weak base, then you can use methyl orange. Okay, for the given diagram, the pH is in higher range, okay, higher than seven. So you can only use phenolphthalein. So this for this titration, phenolphthalein is the only uh, suitable indicator. So this is the case for acid base, and same case also appear for uh, redox titration and redox indicator. Just because it is the redox indicator, you cannot always use it. Like here, just because it is acid base indicator, you cannot always use it, right? You have to find out where uh, you need to have a you know, prior knowledge where the pH will appear. And based on that, you chose your uh, indicator. Okay. Now, let's get into the topic our main topic, topic, okay? Redox titration, and these are some of the terminologies. I'm sure most of you are familiar with these terminologies since you're plus two. Uh, I just want to remind, please have a note copy and a pen ready with you to take some note because we'll be discussing some reactions and also some equations and also some values which will transfer from one slide to another slide. So it will be easier if you note them as we proceed, okay? Now, hope you have pen and paper. Now let's start again. Uh, I want to start from the redox reaction in between, in the middle. So redox reaction, it involves the transfer of electrons between two species. So there is a transfer of electrons. Uh, in the given reaction, the two species are iron two plus and cerium four plus. These are the two reactions, two species, okay? And there's an electron transfer between these species. One of them will donate the electron and the other one will accept that electron, okay? So in this case, the reactant, you have to compare the reactant and the product. For iron, the reactant is Fe2 plus and the product is Fe3 plus. So it goes from two plus to three plus. That means the, the number of electron decreases or it is losing some electron. How many electron did it lose? One electron because it changes from two plus to three plus. And the number two plus and three plus are the oxidation number. Okay, the oxidation number of iron in the reactant side is two plus and the oxidation of iron on the product side is three plus. So there is increase in the number of oxidation number. That means there is a loss of electron and this process is called oxidation. So oxidation is the process of increase in oxidation number or loss of electron. Okay. So for, for the other case, for cerium, cerium 4 plus goes to cerium 3 plus. <clears throat> so there is a decrease in oxidation number from 4 plus to 3 plus. And the decrease occurs when you gain the electron. How many electrons is gained? One electron is gained. So cerium 4 plus to cerium 3 plus is reduction process. Okay. This is the overall redox reaction. However, you can have half reaction, which is you write separately the oxidation half and you write separately the reduction half with the involvement of electrons. In overall reaction, there is no electrons shown, okay? Electrons are canceled out. You have to cancel out the electrons when you show the overall reaction. However, in the half reaction, you have to show the number of electrons involved in that particular half reaction. Okay, now I would like to jump into Nernst equation. This is another important uh, 
equation that we need to get familiar with. We'll be seeing this equation a lot in coming slides. And also I would like to uh, tell it now that the, uh, the whenever we talk about the reaction, we'll be talking about this particular reaction only. Iron plus cerium get iron three plus plus cerium three plus, okay? So the Norse equation, it relates the reduction potential of an electrochemical reaction to the standard electrode potential, temperature, and activities of the chemical species undergoing reduction and oxidation. This is the definition. However, we need to know the equation. So this is the equation, the Norse equation for cerium. Okay, how do we know it's for the cerium? Because the level here is for CE. C -E. So it is for cerium, okay? So on the left-hand side of the equation, it is EC, that is the reduction potential at given condition, okay? What condition? The temperature and concentration. E0 is the standard reduction potential of cerium. Reduction potential when the cerium changes its oxidation state from four plus to three plus. And this, the, this value is known value. You can get it from the table of electrochemical series. Minus 0 0.0592 divided by N, where N is the number of electron involved in that half reaction. Okay, number of electrons involved. Or it is also the difference in oxidation number the difference in oxidation number of reactant and product. So for example, the reactant and product here are four plus and three plus. So the difference is one. Also remember that N is always positive number. So it is absolute change in oxidation number. Okay, N can never be negative value. Times log, cerium three plus divided by cerium four plus, this is uh, product divided by reactant. Which one is the product? Which one is the reactant? How do you know? You know it by looking at this, the inert, how it is written here. The first one is reactant, then you have slash vertical line, and you have product. So here log product divided by reactant, the product is CE3 plus divided by CE4 plus. So in past, you might have seen it as E is equal to E naught minus RT divided by NF ln of Q, where Q is the reaction quotient, okay, where reaction quotient is product divided by reactant. And R is universal gas constant, T is absolute temperature, uh, temperature in Kelvin divided by N, N is the number of electrons involved or change in oxidation number times F, F is Faraday constant. So when you input those constant, the value of R, T and F, you get this number, okay? So this is summarized for 25 degree centigrade or 298 degree Kelvin. Now this is for cerium. The other equation is for iron. Iron is, here it is very similar to cerium. Just know that this is going from iron three plus to iron two plus, because that's how it is written here. Minus this, this, this log. Now it is going from iron three plus, so the product is two plus. So divide product, divide by reactant. Now just remember that, uh, if you look at the given equation, however, the iron changes its oxidation number from two plus to three plus, three plus is the product and two plus is the reactant. However, the equation given here is the reduction potential. So we are always focusing on the reduction side, okay? Not what is in the equation, uh, what is in the chemical reaction. Okay, just remember these two, uh, the way these equations are written. Now, the other terminology is formal potential. It is one of the important um, terminology as well. The potential observed experimentally in a solution containing one mole of each of the oxidized and reduced substances together with other specific, specific substances at 
specified concentration. So remember in this definition, both oxidized and reduced substances should have one mole of them. One mole. Okay, both of them are one mole. And if there are any other substances, we need to know the concentration of those substances as well. Now let's look into the example. See, in these examples, this is the half of the half reaction of the previous equation. Cerium four plus plus electron gives cerium three plus. This is the reduction half. So since the electron is involved, we can always go with the potential. So E naught. So E naught for this reaction. Okay, this is the reduction reaction. So this will be reduction potential is one point one four voltage if the solution is in one molar sulfuric acid. So if it is one molar sulfuric acid, then the same reaction is 1.14 voltage. However, if it is in one molar nitric acid, then it is 1.61. Look at the difference. The value of E naught has changed. Okay, if it is one, uh, if it is SCL of four, then 1.70 voltage. Similarly for iron, so here the equation is given for the reduction as well. Iron three plus changes to iron two plus. There is gain of one electron. The E naught value is uh, 0 0.68 in one molar, 0 0.70 in nitric acid, 0 0.73 in SCLO4. So what this equation, these values are trying to show you is the reduction potential changes on depending on the uh, the concentration of the other species as well and this is the it's called formal potential because in this case you have one mole of ce4 plus and one mole of ce3 plus both of them are one mole then this these are the values okay because of difficulties containing the rigorous definition for formal redox potential, a more practical term used in parallel is half reduction potential. So similar to this formal potential, we use half potential. And these are the same equation that I showed you in previous slides. Okay, these are the half potential uh, nursed equation for cerium and iron. And um, we don't have to do it, but if you have to calculate the E cell, then it is always going to be E cathode minus E anode, where E cathode is the reduction potential of the cathode. E anode is the reduction potential of the anode. E cathode is also called E left minus E right, all of them being reduction potential. Okay. Now, redox titration. Now we get you know the terminologies. A volumetric method of analysis which relies on oxidation or reduction of the analyte using redox indicator or potentiometry. So this is the types of titration, right? Where you use where it relies on oxidation or reduction of analyte. And in addition, we have to use redox indicator. Or you can also use the instrument. The, if you use the instrument, then it is potentiometer to, to measure the voltage. So some of the common oxidizing agents are listed here, chromate, iodate, iodine, permanganate, and some of the common reducing agents are listed here, arsenide, ferrocyanide, ferrous sulfide, and high sulfide, okay? So the equivalent point is based on the concentration of oxidized and reduced form of all the species involved. A redox titration equivalence point occurs when stoichiometrically equivalent amount of analyte and titrant are reacted. That means uh, when you react same equivalent amount of iron two plus with equivalent amount of cerium four plus, then the equivalent point is obtained. Okay, in this case, it is one is to one ratio. So if you react one mole of iron two plus with one mole of uh, cerium four plus, then equivalent point is obtained. Okay. So if you react same mole, here the ratio is also one is to one. So this is an easy example because it's all one is to one is to one is to one ratio. 
So if you react one mole of this with one mole of that, then you also form one mole of Fe3 plus and one mole of uh, one mole of C3 plus. Okay. But how do you determine the equivalent point? Like I showed you in the very uh, first picture that of acid-based titration, you can have the pH of equivalent point. The equivalent point can occur at higher pH or the pH higher than seven, or it can occur at the pH at the seven or the pH below seven, depending on well, what kind of uh, acid or what types of base you have used right so the same thing occurs when you are doing um, redox titration also you you can know in previous like ahead where you are expecting your equivalent point for the given reaction okay so this is the given reaction now we can predict where the equivalent point of this reaction will occur this is just an example you can predict the equivalent point for any given reaction okay so this is the nurse equation for cesium and this is the nurse equation for iron remember both of them are reduction potential okay now uh, the value for n for cesium is also one and also for the iron it is one why it is one because the change in oxidation number is three and four the difference between three and four is one again remember we are taking the absolute value that is we are always taking the positive value okay and the difference between two and three is also one so the value of n is one now we substitute the value of n and these value on the right hand side for e naught is well known value and they can be obtained from electrochemical series or like earlier we showed that it depends on the concentration of other species also so these values right now are just arbitrary value, like they are close to the real value. However, uh, they might not be exact, okay? Uh, we will be practicing with these values. So remember the value 1.70 and 0 0.77. Even you can look at these values and say something about the reaction. For, for example, the reduction potential of cerium is higher than the reduction potential of iron. So cerium must get reduced and iron will get oxidized because the reduction potential of cerium is higher, right? And that's what it is going on. If you look at the reaction, cerium is getting reduced and iron is getting oxidized. However, that is the different part. Now let's focus in here, okay? So we get the, the Norst equation, substituted the value of N and at equivalent point, what happens at equivalent point? At equivalent point, <clears throat> you need to know that now the potential is EEQ for both the case of cerium and iron. So they have same potential. Okay, the reduction potential is same. The standard reduction potential is different. However, those are the constant values. And also at the equivalent point, like I stated earlier, the concentration of I cerium is equal to the concentration of iron three plus these are from the product side the concentration on the product side are equal to are equals and the concentration of the reactant side are also equal right that is when the equivalent point is obtained now we add these two reactions the top two reactions when we add these two reactions we get two eq is equal to this plus that minus which is that upper value or the lower value doesn't matter minus the other value okay now 2 eq is equal to the third two terms the two last terms we put them together okay we factor out 0 0.0592 divided by one that is same for both we also factor out the negative sign now we use the properties of log, which is log A times log B is equal to log A plus B. Oh, sorry, log A plus log B. No, this is the right formula, okay? Log A plus log B is equal to log A times B. So this is what we are showing here. Log, so this is A. When you factor out the negative sign, you have plus. 
log a plus log b is equal to log a times b. Okay, when you do this, now you can look into this uh, uh, this equation and say that this the concentration of three plus equals to concentration of iron three plus. So the the numerator and denominator part cancel out, and the cerium four plus also cancelled with iron two plus. Why? Because that is the case in uh, at equivalent point. Now, when you cancel those, this will be log one. So, what is the value of log one? Log one is zero. So, since the log one is zero, you multiply the sum number with zero. The whole term is zero. So, this whole term is zero at equivalent point. So, then what remains is two eq is equal to e naught of cerium plus e naught of iron because the all other term is zero. Now we divide both sides with two, then we get EQ is equal to this plus this divided by two. And these two value are the standard value. If you have noted them, they are 1.70 plus 0 0.77 divided by two. So we get 1.24 voltage. So the equivalent point for the given reaction is, uh, will occur at 1.24 voltage. Like we were able to guess the equivalent point, the pH for the equivalent point in acid base reaction. Here also we can predict where the equivalent point will occur and that will be in voltage. Okay. The voltage. So for simplicity, for the reaction like the reaction we just discussed, for simple redox reaction, we have EEQ is equal to NA, where NA is the number of electrons involved, times E naught of A, where a is one of the reagent and NB, EV, where B is the other reagent, divided by NA plus NB. So in this case, NA and NB are both one. So you divide with one plus one, two. That's what's happening here, two. And the other one is for cerium and the this one for iron. So you get the value. Okay. Uh, that is how you predict the equivalent point or you determine the equivalent point. And you need to know the equivalent point ahead. I mean, where you expect to see the potential, okay, ahead, because that's how you choose your indicator now. You cannot just use random indicator, you have to choose the indicator. How do you choose the indicator? Like in acid-base reaction, you first predict where your uh, endpoint will occur, in what range of pH it will occur, and then you choose the right indicator, right? Methyl orange, litmus, or phenolphthalein. Similarly, it is same over here also. Equivalent point can be determined using the uh, instrument. If you use the instrument, this, this is the case. However, we'll focus more on equivalent point using indicator, okay? So uh, like in the acid-based titration, the indicator is also um, acid or base. Here in redox titration, the uh, indicator is also uh, ox uh, like one of the oxidized or reduced form. And it can change from oxidized form to the reduced form and also from reduced form to oxidized form. So this reaction should be reversible. Uh, here by mistake, it is a single headed error. However, it must be the equilibrium error. So here the indicator is in the oxidized form. It gains a certain number of electrons and it goes into the reduced form of the indicator. Okay, there is the change in the oxidation number. And it exhibits different color. For oxidized form, it will have one color and for reduced form, it will have different color. And that is how you determine the equivalent point. It will have one color, it changes it to the different color and that is how you determine the equivalent point. So when talking about the different types of indicator, there are mainly three types. One of them is self-indicator, where the reagent itself act as an indicator. So for example, if you use KMnO4 as one of the reagent, then it can act itself as an indicator. When it is in the oxidized form, it has purple color, and when it is in the reduced form, plus two, it is colorless. So the uh, oxidation number of manganese is plus seven here on the reactant, and uh, plus two on the product, so it has different color in oxidized and reduced form. Okay, that is self indicator. The reagent itself changes the color. Okay, the reagent could be unknown or it could be the standard. 
okay either case it changes the color it's there. that is self indicator and it is our less interest on that we have less interest now the other one is a specific indicator so some indicators form a colored compound with a specific oxidized or reduced form of the titrant okay in this example iron 3 plus remember this is 3 plus it is not other state of the iron okay only iron 3 plus react with SCN minus where SCN minus is the indicator to form this complex which is red color so you have colorless to begin with and you form red color this is acting as an indicator however it only combines with three plus state of iron it doesn't combine with other state of iron okay similarly the iodate i3 minus it reacts with combined with starts to form dark blue color and it starts is acting as an indicator these two are our less interest more focus will be on the true redox indicator so what is true redox indicator it is the substance that do not participate in the redox titration that means it is not one of the reagent okay it is just the indicator it is not one of the reagent but whose oxidized and reduced form differ in color like always it one of the oxidized form will have one color and the reduced form of the indicator will have another color and this is the most important type of indicator now in following slides whenever uh, we say redox indicator we are trying to say true redox indicator okay our focus will be on true redox indicator so true redox indicator uh, it can have like oxidized and reduced form like i said earlier and this is the half reaction the oxidized form gain some electron to get reduced form this is the reaction right like others like other reagent for example iron and cerium this also has this indicator also has nurst equation and the nurst equation is e equals to e naught minus 0 0.592 0 0.0592 divided by n log of reduced form divided by oxidized form let's understand this so e is this uh, reduction potential e naught is the standard reduction potential okay of the indicator this is also known value minus 0 0.5092 divided by n what is this n n is the number of electrons involved in this the reaction given on the top okay times log product divided by reactant product is the concentration for the reduced form divided by oxidized form okay <clears throat> now to notice the color change there should be 10 percent conversion to another form that means the ratio one of them must be 10 times greater than the other here you can see the reduced form is one and the oxidized form is 10 so it is either 1 by 10 or 10 by 1 so the expression on the log this this ratio is either one uh, a 10 or 1 by 10 and i'm sure you know log of 10 is 1 and log of 1 divided by 10 is minus 1 so it is either this expression for the log is 1 or minus 1 so that's why we can write it e is equal to e naught of indicator plus minus 0 0.0592 divided by n times 1 however we don't have to write times 1 because the value will be same and y plus minus because log 10 is 1 and log 1 divided by 10 is minus 1 that's why that's why we have plus minus this value this is the reason where this indicator will work uh, if you recall um, for acid based titration the acid base indicators they work they also work in certain range right and if you recall it is pka plus minus one so the pka of the indicator plus minus one that is the better range so this is the range where redox indicator work for them it is e naught of indicator plus minus 0 0.592 okay now let's get into the characteristics of redox indicator and just remember in general all the indicators they need to have very good properties uh, characteristics like we discussed in lecture one 
all the characteristics of the indicator also transfer for redox indicator. However, these are the specific ones, okay? Uh, I just want to re remind you that also remember those for the indicator from lecture one also. So for redox indicator or oxidation reduction indicator should mark the sudden change in oxidation potential in the neighborhood of the equivalent point. So you have the equivalent point, there should be the color change in that range, okay? So for example, if the equivalent point is one voltage, then the color change of the indicator must also be within that one voltage, okay? That's how you choose your indicator redox indicator. The ideal oxidation reduction indicator will be one with an oxidation potential intermediate between that of the solution titrated and that of the titrant and which exhibits a sharp readily detectable color change. That means the, the reduction potential of the redox indicator should be in between the, the reduction potential of two reagents. So there are two reagents, they have their own reduction potential. For example, for cerium, it is 1.70 and for iron, it is 0 0.77. If you have to choose an indicator to work on that reaction, you need to have the indicator with E value in between 1, 0 0.77 and 1.70 in between those two values. Okay. The oxidation and reduction must be reversible and fast. Like we said earlier, the, the indicator must be reversible, like change in oxidation number from one form to the other form, and it should be fast, okay? For a sharp color change in the indicator, the E of the indicator should differ by at least 0 0.15 volt from the standard potential of other system involved in the reaction. What does this mean? So this mean that from point two, what point four is saying is, not just it has to be in between, okay? Higher than one and the lower than other. Not like, the, not only that, however, it should be at least 0 0.15 higher than one reagent and 0 0.15 voltage lower than the other one, okay? Between two reagents, one of them has higher potential and the other one has lower potential. So for the indicator, it should be 0 0.15 higher than the lowest one and 0 0.15 lower than the highest one, then that is the best indicator that you can choose, okay? So the transition potential of indicators should be in between the inert values of the two system. Uh, it is also the same point that we said on point two. It has to be in between, okay? <clears throat> and the indicator potential should always be greater than uh, then the reactant, otherwise the reactant reacts with indicator before and point. So the, the indicator potential should be greater than the reactant. That's what this slide is trying to say. Okay. Now these are some of the types of redox indicator. Uh, this is the table I copied from, I got online, you know. So I just randomly put it. Uh, these are some of the indicator you don't have to memorize. However, if you, I'm just trying to show you these types of table exist and you can know a lot about them ahead, okay? And you need to be aware of them ahead of, of redox titration. So these are the the indicator and they have one color in the oxidized form and they have different color on the reduced form and the E0 value is also known for them. Okay, it is given here. So if you want to use the one of the indicator, for example, the first one, phenosephrine, then your system, the system you are trying to use this should have two reagents with one having the reduction potential less than 0 0.28 and the other having the reduction potential higher than 0 0.28 and the lower should have the value 0 0.15 less than this one, at least that value less, okay? And the other should have at least 0 0.15 higher than this value. Then only you can use this indicator, okay? Now let's move on to the next slide. Uh, also, uh, you need to know the value of N, okay? Which is not given here. However, you need to know what is the N? What is the change in oxidation number for the indicator? Okay. 
So uh, one more time, you need to know the color for the oxidized form. You need to know the color for the reduced form. You need to know the value of E naught and you need to know the value of N ahead of the time before you choose your indicator. Then only you can decide whether the indicator will work or not. So these are the two questions. <clears throat> Maybe that will help you understand uh, the previous uh, points. Uh, there are two indicators. One of them is diphenylamine and the other one is phenylanthylenicillin acid. One of them is suitable. The bottom one is suitable and the top one is unsuitable for ferrous with dichromate, ferrous with dichromate. For the same reaction, one of them is the suitable indicator and the other one is the unsuitable indicator. How do we answer these types of questions? So one way the diphenylamine might fail is maybe it, it's uh, E not E value, E not value is not in between that of ferrous and dichromate. If that is the case, it will fail because the value, if it is not in between these two values, then it will fail, right? Because the one of the criteria is it has to be in between those two values. And the other one is maybe it is in between these two values. However, the difference between one of them is not higher than 0 0.15 voltage. So if the value is not higher than 0 0.15 voltage, the difference is not higher than 0 0.15 voltage, then you cannot use this indicator. Okay, let's see. <coughs> So because the E naught value of iron is 0 0.77 volt and E naught of diphenylamine is 0 0.76, which are very close. So the thing is, these two values are very close. Very close means how close? The value, is, the difference is less than 0 0.15 voltage. Since the difference is less than 0 0.15 voltage, you cannot use it. However, there is also given how you can use it if you use different system. If you use, uh, this might be three minus. So if you use phosphoric acid, for example, as a solvent, then the value of this will get lower. If you lower the value of iron, then it is saying that uh, the difference will be higher. Since the value difference will be higher, it will be a suitable indicator, okay? However, the other indicator is suitable. Why? Because the E naught value for that indicator is 1.08 which is in between 0 0.77 and 1.36 that is good because 1.08 is greater than 0 0.77 and lower than 1.36 that means it is in between uh, it is in between but is the value uh, the difference in value higher than 0 0.15 we need to check that okay what are those two numbers we need to compare we need to compare the one of the indicator the one value is indicator and the other value is the reagent so this reagent and indicator, if you compare these two values, 1.08 and 0 0.77, then the difference is greater than 0 0.15. That is good. Now let's compare the value of indicator with the other reagent. The other reagent value is 1.36 and the difference is higher than 0 0.15 volt. So that is good. That's why you can use phenyl anthranilic acid for this uh, to indicate that mm, indica as an indicator for the determination of ferrous with dichromate. Okay, that's why we need to know the, the, the characteristics point, it helps us to answer these types of questions. Now, let's go into the specific example of some of the indicator. This is phenyl, I mean, is the redox indicator, okay? Now, whenever we say an indicator, we need to know their E0 value, their N value, their working range, their color at the reduced form and in the oxidized form, and the mechanism they work, how they work. What is the reduced form and what is the oxidized form of the indicator, the structure, okay? Now, let's look into this. For diphenylamine, for when we are working in the one percentage of concentrated sulfuric acid, the E0 value is 0 0.76 voltage. Uh, the unit is missed, however, it is volt. And the number of electron involved, N is equal to two. So if you substitute this value in the Norsch equation, you get 0 0.76 plus minus this divided by two, which is 
range is this. This is the range where diphenylamine will work. So if you have any reaction which has equivalent point that appears in this range, then you can use diphenylamine for that system, okay, with other criteria as fulfilled. So below zero point potential below this, the color is in the reduced form, which is colorless. And above this value, it is in the oxidized form. The color is violet blue. Its working range is this. And the color changes from colorless to violet in this range. Okay. So for the structure of the diphenylamine, this mechanism, you need to know the mechanism. So diphenylamine means di means two, phenyl means benzene ring, amine means NH2. Or NH3 in this case. So uh, two benzene ring are attached to the nitrogen like shown here. And since nitrogen forms three bond, the other bond is formed with hydrogen. So this is diphenylamine. However, the diphenyl benzadine is the indicator, okay? This is where the indicator comes into play. This is the reduced form and it is colorless. It goes into the oxidized form by losing two hydrogen. What are the two hydrogen that are lost? Uh, let's go for the first reaction first. Uh, this is single headed arrow, so that means it is one directional. It also loses two hydrogen. Those two hydrogen are lost from the para position of the amine, of the, when compared to the amine. So from this ring, and two of these same structure combined, they lose, each of them lose hydrogen and they form this bond. Okay. However, the second reaction is equilibrium. That means it can go from reduced form to oxidized form. Also, it can go from oxidized to reduced form. Okay. In this case also it loses two hydrogen and those two hydrogen in this case are lost from the hydrogen attached to nitrogen. So the color coding here shows that they are lost from the nitrogen. So whenever this hydro nitrogen loses one hydrogen, it now you move as, moves that lone pair of electron to form a double bond here. This, car, this double bond moves here, this double bond moves here, the other double one moves here, this one moves here, and this nitrogen loses another hydrogen. That's how these two hydrogens are lost. And along with those two hydrogens, two electrons are also lost. That is why the compound started with neutral, end up in neutral. This is oxidized form, which is violet color, and this is reduced form, which is colorless. Okay, know the mechanism. And this diphenylamine is especially used when you are using K2CRO4 or K2CRO2O7 as an oxidizing agent. Now let's move into another indicator. The another indicator is very similar to diphenylamine and it is named as diphenyl amino sulfunic acid. It is a derivative of diphenylamine. Derivative means it can be derived from diphenylamine. Something is changed in diphenylamine to get diphenyl amino sulfonic acid. So what is changed? This is the structure. So in the para position to the nitrogen, it loses hydrogen to attach SO3. If it is acid, then instead of Na, you have H. However, this is the salt form and it is written in the Na as Na, okay? Na for sodium. And it is better than the diphenylamine because this compound is more polar than the diphenylamine and it is water soluble, okay? So like diphenylamine, you need to know E0 value for this, which is 0 0.80 and it is N value is one. For diphenylamine, N value was two. However, the N value for this reaction is one, okay? And the working range is, you substitute in the uh, Norse equation and you get this is the working range. The reduced form has green color and the oxidized form has violet color. So the color changes gradually from green to violet. The mechanism is same as diphenylamine. That means first it loses hydrogen, two hydrogen to form uh, diphenyl, I mean benzene, like the previous, the other structure. Okay, and then it loses the hydrogen to get the oxidized form. Hydrogen means hydrogen ion, okay? So it undergoes two sequential color change. That means first it goes from colorless. So, so in previous example, it goes from colorless to colorless, and then from green, uh, the colorless to 
the other structure, right? But however, here it goes from colorless to uh, green. And remember, this is single headed arrow. So this is one directional. Then the green form is the reduced form. This is the indicator. Now it go, can go to the oxidized form, which is the violet color. Okay. Ferroin. Uh, ferroin is the, the common name, and here is the other name 110 phenanthrolin iron 2 or orthophenanthrolin. And its inert value is 1.147. N is 1. This is the working rays, rains. Uh, reduced form has red color. Oxidized form has pale blue color. It changes from red to pale blue. This is the reduced form. This is the structure of oxidized form. Uh, remember that the reduced form is called ferroin and the oxidized form is called ferrin, like for ferrous and ferric. Here you have Fe2+, plus. here you have Fe3+. Plus. So for Fe2+, plus is a reduced form, ferroin, like ferrous. And Fe3 plus is ferrin, like ferric. And remember the structure and the bracket is same in both of the cases. In both cases, there are three of them. Three of them. There are two coordinate covalent bond. Okay, in both cases. This is what you need to know. <coughs> Sorry. Now you, we discussed some of the uh, indicators, their properties. Now we move from indicator to the reagent. Okay, so the two of the reagent that we need to study are potassium bromate and ceric salt. Potassium bromate, the formula of potassium bromate is KBRO3. So potassium is K and bromate is BRO3. So it is very powerful oxidizing agent. It can be found in pure state and it's soluble in, solution is stable. It is really good. That's why we need to study it. Okay, remember that. So it is uh, smoothly reduced smoothly to bromide. So BRO3 minus is the bromate. It reduces into bromide. In bromate, the oxidation number of bromine is uh, looks like plus five. So it changes to minus one. And the inert value for that is 1.44. Okay, and then this bromide reacts with bromate. The bromate and bromide reacts to form to give bromine. The color of the bromine is yellow. So you can determine this reaction by the color formation of yellow color. However, you can if you do that, then that is the self indicator, right? However, you can also use uh, other in true indicator like methyl orange, methyl red, uh, red or other indicator to indicate the equivalent point. Okay, so. Remember, it can form bromide that can react to form bromine. So this is used. The two main uses or the two main significance of potassium bromate is it can be used as a direct oxidant for certain reducing agents. So that means it is it can be used as directly. Okay, you form you directly. You know the concentration of bromate. You directly react with other reducing agent and you determine the concentration of that reducing agent. Or you can use it to produce certain amount of bromine, like the reaction given here, the second reaction. You can use this bromate to form bromine. Then you can use this bromine to for other reaction, okay, that we'll be discussing now. So these are the two major significance or two major advantage of bromate. Direct titration. So if you have to do the direct titration, it can we can use it with the reducing agent like arsenic, antimony, iron, and certain other sulfide. Or you directly add bromate into those re reagents like shown here. You directly add it, you form bromide, and that bromide will be reacted, again react with bromate to form bromine, which can be which will indicate the end point. Uh, and the, remember that you need to know this balanced chemical reaction. That is how you track the concentration of the other reagent. Okay. 
Now more than this, this is less significant for us. More significant is the indirect titration that is discussed in this last paragraph. So various substances that cannot be oxidized directly with KBrO3 but react quantitatively with excess of bromine. So they react quantitatively with certain quantity. Okay? A standard solution of KBrO3 is employed to generate non-quantities of bromine. So you use KBrO3 to produce non-quantity of bromine in presence of bromide. That means you add KBrO3 and you add Br minus. You add both of them to produce non quantity of bromine then you use that bromine to react with other organic compound and that will be called indirect titration why indirect titration because you are not using kbro3 kbro3 directly you are using kbro3 to react with br minus to produce bromine then this bromine is now reacted to for quantitative study Okay, now we'll focus on indirect titration. Indirect titration with bromate. How do we do indirect titration? Reaction of bromine with organic compound is either substitution. So it, bromine, it will substitute some other um, species or addition. Okay, or you add bromine as addition like Substitution will be bromination of benzene. If you remember some bromination of benzene, then there is the substitution reaction. And if you use the uh, addition, for example, bromine, bromination of ethene, then that is the addition reaction, right? So what do you do? This is the procedure here. In the analysis of the organic compound, a measured excess of KBr and KBrO3. So KBr is the source of Br minus, and KBrO3 is the source of BrO3 minus. So that means you are adding both Br minus and BrO3 minus, both of them, to produce Br2. So you produce known amount of Br2 after the bromination. Now you conduct bromination either as substitution or addition. Reaction is complete. The excess bromine is determined by the addition of Ki. Now you do the reaction and you reacted certain, uh, you pro first produced known amount of Br2. Then you react that with for bromination and there is some Br2 left over. Okay. Now you need to determine how much of Br2 is left over. For that you react with Ki followed by titration of liberated iodine with standard thiosulfate. That is summarized here. So this for example Br2 is the excess Br2 now. You react with Ki, from Ki you have I minus to produce I2. Now you produced I2, you react that I2 with thiosulfate, SO2, 3, 2 minus, and this is where you detect the equivalent bond. Okay, now if you go back, you know the concentration of thiosulfate, and you know the volume required, so you determine the mole of I2, now, once you find the I2 value, you go back to this equation, you determine the value of Br2, and that is the excess Br2. You know the Br2 you produced, and you know the Br2 you left over. The difference will give you the Br2 that is used up in the bromination, and that used up bromination will help you to determine what is the concentration of, or the, what the quantitative value for other reagent. Okay, so here is an example. This is the example you can work out. I have given all the uh, all the re required reaction, all the required values, and the question is at the end calculate the percentage of sulfonamide in the powder. Looks like there is a powder which is which contains certain amount of sulfonamide, and you need to know how much is what mass is present in the given mass okay so the given mass of the powder is 0 0.2981 not all of them is sulfonamide only certain amount is sulfonamide so you need to find out first what is that how many gram of this is the sulfonamide then you can get the percentage which is gram of sulfonamide divided by uh, gram of antibiotic times 100 percentage right 
However, to determine the gram of sulfenamide, you have to do lots of calculation. Let's look into it. First, dissolve in HCl and the solution is diluted to 100 ml. So you can get the concentration. 20 ml of the aliquot. So this is the sample. Now you take the 20 ml of the aliquot as transferred to the flask followed by 25 milliliter of this. So you have that sample and you have 25 milliliter of KBRO3 with known concentration. Then you add excess KBR to produce BR2. Okay, you have excess. So what is the limiting reagent here? The limiting reagent is KBRO3. So the, uh, the amount of BR2 produced depends on the amount of KBRO3. It came from balanced chemical reaction. And the flask was stopped. So you close the flask so that none of the bromine produced will escape or anything will escape, okay? After 10 minutes, during which time the bromine brominated the sulfenamide, so it brominated, excess of Ki was added. Why you add Ki? Because now you want to react it with Br2, leftover Br2. Now the Br2 leftover is the limiting reagent and Ki is in excess, okay? The liberated iodine, now certain amount of iodine is produced, which is determined by the leftover Br2, it requires this volume of this concentration of th sodium thiosulfide. Now we need to determine the percentage. So these are the reaction. Let's try to understand the reaction. So again, you go from the back. These are the reaction. Okay, first you have bromide and bromide, uh, bromate, bromate and bromide to produce bromine. And this is the balanced chemical reaction. You can, however, double check. Make sure it should be balanced. Okay, otherwise you will not get correct answer. Uh, in this reaction, your BRO3 minus is the limiting reagent. So the relationship between, there is a relationship between only BR2 and BRO3 minus. This one is to three relationship. Now you produce this BR2, you react with sulfenamide. And this is the reaction, even here. It is brumination reaction, okay? You can see substitution reaction. And it reacts in one is to two ratio. Now you react with bromine. So the limiting reagent is sulfenamide. So some of the Br2 is leftover. You react that leftover bromine with excess iodine, Ki minus, to produce I2. So the amount of I2 formed depend on the amount of I Br2 because Br2 is the limiting reagent. Okay. Now you that amount of I2 formed, you react with thiosulfate to do this. These are the reactions you read. However, you have to work from backward. That means first determine the mole of thiosulfate. How do you know it? Because the volume and the concentration is given. Now you determine the mole of thiosulfate. You determine the mole of I2. That is the amount of I2 that was liberated. Now go back to next previous reaction. That is the amount of I2 liberated. Compare it with Br2. They work in one is to one ratio. So that is the amount of Br2 in excess. That is in excess. And you can find how much Br2 you, were, you produced given the volume and the concentration of KBRO3 because BRO3 is the limiting reagent. You know how much Br2 you produced in first reaction. You know how much Br2 was left over. You subtract that will give you the amount of Br2 used. That amount of Br2 used is this Br2. That will help you to find the amount of sulfenamide. Remember they work in one is to two ratio. So for X amount of Br2, you only require X divided by two amount of sulfenamide. Now you determine the, the mole of sulfenamide, convert it into mass, the molecular mass is given. Okay, convert into the mass, and that is the mass of sulfenamide in your antibiotic. You can use that mass of sulfenamide to determine the percentage of sulfenamide. Okay. Seric salt. And this seric salt is, again, it is very good. That's why we have to study it. Remember that. Uh, it can only exist in cerium, can only exist in two oxidation states. That's why it is helpful because it is either plus four or plus three. Plus four is oxidized form and plus three is reduced form. 
okay and these are their it's um e naught value at given concentration of sulfuric acid and it has to we have to work on sulfur on acidic condition because otherwise if you work in the basic condition then it will form uh, hydroxide these are the advantages okay um, these are all theories i can read all of them or you can read on your own because there is not much to understand from the advantages okay um, it's a, it has lots of advantages it is very strong oxidizing agent um, it is very stable form plus 4 it can be used to determine the concentration of oxygen reducing agent. Uh, it can be obtained in pure form. It is not very highly colored to obstruct the vision. It is versatile. Uh, it can be used to standardize other reagent. Uh, it can be used in most of the titration where other reagent cannot be used. And in compared to other reagent, it does not have any, it has very low toxicity to the environment. Okay, this is the end of the slide. Hope you understood what is redox titration. I hope you, uh, you were able to compare uh, you get some of the information from acid base reaction or acid base tit titration and which help you to understand redox titration. You understood the Norst equation, how to implement it. Uh, you understood the, the significance of reduction potential in redox titration. You understood the, uh, how to determine the, the E0 value, the, to predict the E0 value for equivalent point. For the given reaction, you know how which what how to choose the redox indicator. Not all the redox indicator can be used for all types of reaction. You have to choose them, and you got some example of the redox indicator. Uh, we discussed three of them, and we discussed two of the oxidizing agent: potassium bromate and ceric salt. In potassium bromate, we understood the direct titration and indirect titration. And there is one numerical that you can solve that will help you to understand the indirect titration. And we discussed the ceric salt and listed the advantages of ceric salt. With that, I would like to end this session. Uh, we'll meet in lecture three. Thank you.